You're listening to Can I Say That, a project created by Brenna Blaine in hopes of engaging culture as Christians in a post-Christian world. Here, we hope to ask the questions we sometimes ponder, but rarely have a chance to ask in the church. Jesus said, he is the way and the truth and the life. So we hope we can engage truth together and in extension, know the eternal life he offers. Hey, you guys. Happy September. If you know me, you know that fall is my absolute favorite time of the year. So I'm super excited. So happy early Halloween to everyone else who also loves the fall. We have a good episode for you guys today. Many of you have asked for a podcast on the topic of modesty. And so I've really been looking forward to doing this one. Today on the show, we have Kat Harris, and I heard about Kat Harris through our friend Felicia Masonheimer. Kat Harris is the host of the Refined Collective podcast and the co-founder of the online publication, The Refined Woman. Her book, Sexless in the City, came out this last April, and she is also a full-time photographer, and she has been featured in the likes of New York Times, Vanity Fair, GQ, Forbes, people just to name a few. And if you know me or you've seen Kat Harris perhaps on social media, you might be saying, wait a second, Brenna, it seems as if you and Kat Harris land on the opposite ends of the spectrum when it comes to some biblical issues. And you would be correct. But if you have listened to this show for any amount of time, you know one thing that we really believe in is having conversations and listening to views that we might not normally or naturally be inclined to listen to. The other thing is that this topic of modesty, when Kat and I had this conversation, Kat actually shared a lot of things that I myself can really identify with. I would say when she talks about her experience at church summer camps, that that definitely happened to me and many other girls in my community. So before you decide, maybe I'm not going to listen because I don't think I agree with her. I'd love to invite you just to sit through it and recognize there's a lot of great nuance that takes place in this conversation that Kat shares with us. There's also a lot of great resources that she shares with us that even her herself, she says, man, this person's more conservative than where I land, but I still really appreciated what they had to say. So As always, if you enjoy this episode or found it challenging and that it helped you work through some of the ideas that you have had about modesty, let us know. Please tag us on Instagram. That's probably the biggest way that we have grown and been able to share our episodes with people who wouldn't normally be able to find us. You can also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or anywhere else you are able to find podcasts and leave reviews. Go ahead and let us know what you think of the show. Without further ado, I hope you guys enjoy and wrestle through this conversation about modesty, biblical modesty in the evangelical church. So it seems as if there's an interesting disparity between the way that the Bible talks about the topic of modesty and then the way that evangelicals have historically taught what modesty is. Can you give us some insight about what those discrepancies are? <laughs> where, do, where does one even begin? I think when I think about the major discrepancies, just in general between scripture and evangelical culture, is that When I look at the story of the Bible, I feel like from first page to final page, it's a story where God is after our hearts, where transformation is an inside out process, where God and Jesus, Holy Spirit cares way more about our heart than behavior modification. And when I look at the evangelical, and when I'm referring to evangelical church, I'm largely referring to Western church in America, what I see prominently is a message from the front that says salvation is Jesus alone. But really, if we're reading in between the lines of what is being taught and what is not being taught from the pulpit, often it's Jesus plus virginity, Jesus plus 
cover your bodies as a woman. Jesus plus, do you drink alcohol? Jesus plus, who are you attracted to? And we add all of these rules and to do's and not do's in order to have your seat at the table in the church. And my massive problem with that is the Bible. That's, that's not the invitation of Jesus. The invitation of Jesus is come all you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Not like girls, you better not wear spaghetti strap shirts and girls, you are the source. You are the problem. You are the root cause of an entire gender sin struggle. So I think what happens often in the church is we want to focus on outward to inside transformation, whereas scripture is inside out. When evangelicals or even just people who are outside of that space, but have this certain mindset about modesty, when we make modesty all about appearance, what does that do to those who sit under that specific mindset? I mean, all I can do is speak to my own experience. So For me, growing up in a church culture that heavily focused on modesty for women, on the idea that men are more sexual than women and more visual than women and have a higher sex drive than women, all of those things because of those things, they are so weak sexually that women must bear the burden of their their biology and the way they're wired. So it was up to us as women to cover our bodies so that men wouldn't sin, so that men wouldn't struggle. So we wouldn't cause our brothers in Christ, quote unquote, to stumble. And I think in the moment, I I remember actually the first time I ever heard about modesty. I was a senior in high school and I was at church camp for my high school in the summer and the girls would go with the girls for an hour or so of teaching. The guys would go with the guys and who knows what they are being taught about. But what we're being taught about is that when we wear bikinis and when we wear short shorts, we are really hurting our brothers in Christ. And I think in that moment, I both felt extremely powerful, like, whoa, my body is that powerful that it can cause a guy to do something that he doesn't want to do. And then I also felt other things like, whoa, guys can't control themselves. Boys really will just be boys. Like that's what culture says. Culture says boys will be boys. And then And wrapped in different jargon, that's the same message I'm hearing from the church. So then it felt very oppressive. And I was terrified of being the source of someone else falling into temptation or sin. I became terrified of my body and I hid my body. I stopped wearing bikinis. I wore really ugly tankinis, if you remember those in the early 2000s. And I think the message that I largely received, and I don't know if this was, I really don't believe this was the intention, but it doesn't matter if you intend it or not, like the received, the received outcome could be different. I think I just felt really ashamed of my body and of just existing. It felt like existing as a woman, just living, breathing was wrong because I felt hypersexualized by culture. You know, culture says sex sells and everywhere you see in any magazine is women, you know, being told to flaunt their bodies because sex sells. And in the church, we're equally being hypersexualized as women and told our bodies are so scandalous and provocative that we better hide them. And so it just taught me a message of shame shutting down my body, shutting down my sexual desire, believing anything physical was wrong. And so I just better do whatever I can do to make sure that guys don't sin. And so for a long time, I led the charge. Modest, hottest ladies, we got to cover our bodies. We got to make sure that guys are respected and, and that we honor that they're just so much more visual than us and that they're so weak that they will just be boys. And if they have a desire, they can't control it. So I think I bought into that life for a really long time. And, you know, on the flip side, and I'm sure we can talk about more of that later. I don't think that the answer to that is that, you know, let me wear whatever I want, whenever I want, however I want it, because that doesn't necessarily mean freedom. I do think that there can be a healthy space for asking for all humans, what is how can I honor myself, God, and others with what I wear? But 
I think historically modesty has been used as a one dimensional approach to women and in essence has weaponized the female body and has been very destructive and oppressive. I want to walk that out a little bit more because there, there are probably those who are listening going, well, what about, you know, the verse where it says, don't cause your brother to stumble. So can you just talk about a little bit more how when we only apply this modesty thing to women, as far as appearance goes, how is that harmful to women, especially in our sexuality and when we're expressing that and just like trying to live life without being ashamed of our bodies? Well, first, it does a couple things. First, it it first says that men are more sexual than women, which I just don't believe that's true. It hasn't been my experience. It hasn't been, I've, I've been researching now for seven years. I've done polls and graphs and R and D with thousands of women all over the world. Women get very turned on by bodies as well. And I remember I was a camp counselor in college at the summer camp and the girls, we had to wear pretty much baggy oversized t-shirts with almost like basketball type shorts nothing form-fitting, nothing revealing our shoulders or anything. And it wasn't like, I wasn't at like an Amish camp or anything. Like this was a camp that D1 athletes were coaches at in the summer to coach and mentor high school students. And so the girls are walking around. I mean, I've never felt less (laughs) cute in my life, just frumpy blob, like sweaty, frumpy blob. And yet the guys, because we were taught, you know, guys, are more sexual than girls. So girls cover your body. And in essence, that means girls are not sexual. Girls don't struggle with lust. Girls don't get turned on by the male body. Guys were allowed to wear whatever they wanted. So all day long, it's 100 degrees outside and we're sweating in these trash bags, essentially. Guys were running around with no shirts all day with short, tiny basketball shorts that they were wearing to be like ironic and funny that they're wearing these like 70s basketball shorts and they would come in for a lunch and I would be like, oh my gosh, that guy is so freaking hot. He has like sweat and sunscreen dripping down his eight pack abs. <laughs> like, And I was like, oh, there must be something wrong with me because I'm attracted to that because I've been told that I'm not sexual in the way that guys are. So not only am I already shut down to my sexual desire, but any time that I feel any sort of attraction physically because of what a guy is or isn't wearing, there must be something doubly wrong with me. So I think that, I think it's problematic to not uphold integrity, sexual integrity between both men and women and ask the question, what is it so that my sister doesn't stumble? What is it so my brother doesn't stumble? I think another thing that can happen, which is can be really problematic is making a general sweeping statement of what is or isn't appropriate to wear for all people at all time. I think so much of this conversation has to do with context. So for instance, any sort of bathing suit in first century Roman culture would have any sort of bathing suit that we wear today, whether it's a one piece, a tankini, um, a thong bathing suit, anything would have been completely scandalous and provocative and inappropriate. Now, if I were to go to, to Morocco on a trip tomorrow, it would be very inappropriate to have like my elbows showing or my hair, like it would be honoring to wear a head covering while I visited that country. I've lived in a part of Brooklyn for almost a decade now where there's a large population of Hasidic Jews. And the women out of modesty never show their real hair, wear wigs, never show anything below their collarbone, above their wrists or above their ankles. And that is modesty. And I could wear a bathing suit to the beach and it'd be fine. Would I wear that to preach on Sunday uh, for a sermon? No. Would I wear my yoga pants to yoga class? Yes. Would I wear that same workout outfit to apply for a job interview? No. So I think what happens when we generalize modesty is we're removing nuance and context from a conversation and not asking questions like, what's culturally appropriate? What's context specific for the specific situation that I am in? And what is going to be honoring for myself as opposed to modesty being about the other person? 
how do I want to show up and take responsibility for the space I'm taking up in the world? So I think when we say don't make another brother stumble, well, one guy's maybe one guy is turned on by toes and the other guy is like, man, feet are so disgusting to me. I don't want to see a feet. And another guy might be like, oh my gosh, breasts really turn me on. Or another guy might be like, oh my gosh, when a girl has a dimple on her smile, it is the biggest turn on for me. So it's like, I can't spend my time constantly trying to assume, project what is going to turn a guy on. And really the onus is on a man taking responsibility for the space he's taking up in the world, just as it's my responsibility as a woman to take responsibility for the space I'm taking up in the world. If he has a struggle with porn, lust, fantasizing, objectifying women, that's not my problem. That's not my fault. He gets to take ownership and put parameters in his life to show up with honor. Now, does that mean like, I don't want to be kind to him? No, it's not. I think it would be like, you know, you don't want a drunk working as a bartender at a bar, right? How can we set each other up for success without without flattening clothing and prescribing, okay, well, girls can't wear this and they can't wear this because by doing that, we are saying, well, this part of a woman is sexual and this part isn't and this part is good and this part is bad. So I think so much of it, we lose so much nuance and ownership and ownership also leads to consent. And then the final thing I'll kind of say about the question on how do you really navigate this is the reason why I get so passionate about this is because we all lose when we make modesty about a woman just covering up her body. And we all lose because we're saying things on the narratives underneath the narratives are like guys are more sexual than girls. Uh, boys will be boys and they just can't help themselves. I believe that that is really out of alignment with scripture. Genesis 1 says that God exhaled the breath of life into humanity, both genders, and said that we are very good. And in, in the New Testament, there's echoes of that same theology where we're told that our bodies are a house for the holy. Our bodies are a temple for the Holy Spirit. And God doesn't reside in bad things. And so if we go back to that Genesis 1 scripture, we see it doesn't just say that like women are very good. It says that God breathed the breath of life into humans and humankind is very good. We have the God image in us. So why I'm passionate about this is because I think that this narrative about modesty, while it oppresses women, it flattens what it means to be a man. I believe that men are so powerful. I believe that men have the ability to take ownership over their sexual integrity. I believe that men have just as much control over the desires as women are expected to have. I believe that we are equal. I believe that we both have the power to take up space in the world with honor. And in that, we can support each other. But I think... I think sometimes people get their panties up in a wad when I talk about this. They're like, you just hate guys. And I'm like, no, I love men. I think men are awesome. And it's time that we start treating them like they are made in God's image, just like women are. And so when we oppress women, we are also making men a little less human. And when we're making someone else less human, we're all losing. So for those who work with young people, either in the church or outside of the church, but who have a faith influence, how do we have more biblically accurate conversations concerning modesty? How do we take it back instead of saying it's just about bodies, it's just about sexuality? How do we have a conversation that says, hey, modesty is so much more than this, and it's also so much more freeing than what it's made out to be? Oh, that's a really good question. I what I am very curious about is what if we started with an approach of teaching people about their worth from the inside out? One of my favorite books that I read and research on modesty is by a woman named Wendy Shallot. She's this Jewish feminist, and she wrote A Return to Modesty in the 90s in response to the college hookup scene. And she says that there's two types of modesty. She says the first type of modesty is essentially developing an internal definition of self. When you know who you are, you don't generally feel a need to brag, 
to show your naked body to strangers or to be involved physically with, with people who don't care about you. The second type of modesty entails recognizing the vulnerability of others and protecting it. As with a boy who receives a compromising photo of a girl and ignores orders to pass it on. And then she further points out that genuine modesty flows from the inside out and in proportion to how much a person understands her own greatness and uniqueness. So in other words, what Shala is saying is the physical reveals the climate of our internal landscape. Whereas so much of the whole like modesty and modest's hottest framework is rooted in shame and projects male sexual integrity onto women, Shala is really arguing that modesty starts and ends with love, the love of self and the love of others, which I feel like if we then turn to scripture, we see, you know, Paul says to the Corinthians, a similar message that love is dynamic and freeing and it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. So when I think of how do we talk to our young kids about something like modesty, I think we start with what Charlotte invites us into is that modesty flows from the inside out and in proportion to how much a person understands their own greatness. I think often in the church, we focus so much on how bad I am, how much of a piece of crap I am. And I just, I'm just like nothing without Jesus, you know? And I'm like, yeah, like we all need Jesus. But I think we often start the God story at chapter three in the fall, but it started in chapter one, it started in chapter one, where the climax of the creation story was humanity. And God did something different and distinct with humans than God did with any other aspect of creation. God breathed the God image into every human. So I'm actually not a piece of crap. <laughs> like I have infinite worth and value because God breathed life into me. Just because I exist, just because I breathe, I matter. And then we see echoes of that all throughout the scripture. Psalm 139, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I wonder if we could start the conversation around modesty by not teaching people what they should or shouldn't wear, but how incredible we are as humans, how much worth I have, you have, we have, because we are made in the image of God. I really think if we started the conversation with really teaching our young people how to have a deep internal sense of self. I think Charlotte's right. I think when I, I know this to be true for me, the more grounded I got in my identity, the less I wanted to make out with random strangers at bars on Friday nights. It became less attractive to me because I knew, gosh, like I am really valuable. And not only am I valuable, so is that random stranger I'm kissing that I don't even care about. So when I know that I matter, then I see that they matter too. And so I think starting with the heart in this conversation is so important. And then from there, we can go to, we can talk about being present. For instance, there's, there's clothes that I, I remember I was speaking at this conference and I feel like, I don't know if you've ever felt this way, but it's like, you don't know that it's like a bad bra until you're like speaking in front of people. And you're like, oh my gosh, why is this bra strap falling off? Every two seconds, does it always do it? But I don't notice it because I'm not speaking in front of people. Well, there I am speaking at this conference and my bra strap keeps sliding down every few minutes. And I was like, oh my gosh, it totally distracted me, totally took me out of the moment every time I had to make my strap go back up my shoulder. And, you know, I realized if something's distracting to me, it's probably distracting to someone else. And so is what I am or am not wearing keeping me from being present to the moment at hand? Another thing that Wendy Shallot says is modesty has the opportunity to give me the freedom to think about other things than do I look okay? Am I going to have a wardrobe malfunction? And so as we're getting dressed, is this outfit, is this piece of clothing allowing me to be more or less present? And then we move to the conversation around context. Like, am I posting this picture on Instagram of me in a bikini because I feel like it's life-giving or it's leading to my flourishing? Or am I really just wanting someone to think I'm pretty? I'm wanting to make my ex jealous. I'm wanting validation. Is it, you know, kind of the whole conversation again is, you know, could I wear the bathing suit at the beach? Yes. Would I wear it to a job interview? No. Would I wear a fun skirt? 
like to go dancing on the town? Yes. Would I wear that same outfit if I were preaching on a Sunday? No. And this is not living a duplicitous lifestyle. It's just using wisdom to discern the context of a given social situation. So I think we start with heart. We start with teaching our young people that you matter. You are made in the image of God. And because of that, like just because you exist, you are worthy, period, the end. And then let's talk about presence. And then let's talk about context. And then let's get to the practicality of it. You just mentioned a really great resource. Are there any other resources that you've come into contact with that you're like, man, this is really great, whether it's a a book or someone on Instagram or another podcast, what has been formative to you surrounding the modesty conversation? So I would definitely say A Return to Modesty by Wendy Shallot is a great read. And it's actually surprisingly, um, it's pretty, well, it's not, maybe not surprisingly, it's pretty conservative. And there's some parts of it where I'm like, I don't know if I totally agree with everything in here, but I love her approach to modesty. It's, I think she's spot on about so many things. There's a book I'm reading right now called A Year of Biblical Womanhood um, by the late Rachel Held Evans that it has a whole chapter talking about modesty and Proverbs 31. And basically the book Rachel wrote this book to live for an entire year taking the Bible literally. And so she does an entire month of living like the Proverbs 31 woman and does an entire month of making sure that she's up before dawn and staying up past light and covering her head when she prays. So it's a really fascinating read. And then I would say The Great Sex Rescue by Sheila Gregori. Totally saying her name wrong and I'm really sorry. And then there's two great books by Peggy Orenstein. One is called Girls in Sex, and the other is called Boys in Sex. And then a great podcast about healthy masculinity is Man Enough with Justin Baldoni. I love that podcast so much. He just had a really incredible conversation with his wife, Emily, on the on the podcast. And it's all about addressing toxic masculinity and how to really make steps forward and the, in calling men to a more healthy space in their and what it means to be a man. And then Kat, before we end, you just in the last year came out with a book called Sexless in the City. Can you just share about that? What is it about? What was your heart behind it and your intention? And then how can we find you on social media and how can we buy your book? Thanks for asking. So actually a lot of what we're talking about today is in my book. I have a whole chapter called Modest is Hottest and other damaging things I said growing up. So Sexless in the City was really birthed out of me going on a personal journey. I grew up in Southern Christian culture and learned about things like modesty and saving sex until marriage and gender roles and dating rules and all of that fun stuff and really never questioned it until I moved to New York City around a decade ago and started dating. (laughs) And I dated more in one year than I had in a decade and really was realizing, oh my gosh, it's a lot harder to not have sex when I'm actually dating people and when I'm falling in love. And I got to a place where I realized I had really no idea why I was saving sex for marriage outside of, well, my pastors told me to do that. And so I went on a journey that I thought would be like a 30 minute quiet time or I'm like, researching what the Bible says about sex and modesty and relationships and all of that. And it turned into basically a seven-year research project (laughs) where I just started asking any and every question that I could about God and sex and sexuality and relationships and sexual desire and really anything and everything in between. And, And so Sexless in the City is the book of all my questions and the journey I went on and really finding and experiencing a God that is so much bigger and more loving and more gracious than I ever could have anticipated. You can find that on Amazon or Barnes and Noble, Kindle, Audible, or honestly, really anywhere you buy books, you can get it. My Instagram is The Refined Woman. My website is therefinedwoman.com. And my weekly podcast is called The Refined Collective with Kat Harris. Well, that's it for today's episode. Thanks for listening to the conversation. Brennan and I hope you found it both helpful and relevant. 
If you have any questions or thoughts, please feel free to reach out to us on Instagram at Can I Say That Show. We almost always use Instagram stories to ask questions pertaining to the next episode leading up to the recording. So keep a lookout for such in case you have any burdening questions on that topic and for the opportunity to potentially have your questions asked. Either way, thanks again for listening, and as Paul said to the church in Thessalonica, test everything, hold fast what is true.